Thanksgiving and here comes Santa Claus. 156 of them actually on jet skis for charity, bringing in summer down under as the holiday season is now upon us. Major news today on the race for a COVID vaccine. Moderna becomes the second drug maker now to request emergency use authorization, claiming it's 100% effective against severe cases. This as shipments of Pfizer's vaccine are now arriving in cities across the country, but who will be able to get it first? The anticipated aftermath from the busy weekend of travel against health officials' guidance. Dr. Anthony Fauci now warns of a surge upon a surge as millions return home from the holiday. Stay at home orders and shutdowns as the U.S. is now averaging 1,500 deaths every day. Levels not seen since May. More than 4 million Americans were infected in November alone, doubling the number of cases in October. President-elect Biden unveils his economic team today while Arizona certifies its election for Biden. President Trump refuses to accept defeat, continuing with his increasingly losing legal fight and now attacking the Republican governor of Georgia, who he endorsed. The latest on the assassination of Iran's top nuclear scientist. Iranian leaders vow revenge, and a top official accuses Israel of using remote-controlled weapons to kill him. The major case taken up by the Supreme Court, President Trump's desire to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census, where the justices may stand and the potential impacts. Lot of money I see. Mariana Von Zeller joins us to talk about how her crew was almost robbed filming that scene and much more from her new intense docu-series. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. A ticking time bomb. That's what some officials are calling this particular moment. Tonight, the waiting game is on. And the outcome is largely tied to the following questions. How many Americans had a socially distant Zoom Thanksgiving with their family? And how many gathered safely outside with record high temperatures last Thursday? Those answers may dictate whether an already out of control pandemic gets even worse in the next two weeks. Dr. Deborah Burks is now urging the Millions who traveled to get tested this week and assume they are infected and self quarantine. We'll get to the holiday concern in a moment and the rise in cases forcing states to open new field hospitals tonight. But we begin with more promising news in the race for a vaccine. Developments today and the rest of this week may set the stage for some Americans to get vaccines before the end of the month. Steve Osinsami is in Atlanta tonight with the latest developments. ABC News has confirmed that the first shipments of the Pfizer vaccine for the coronavirus have traveled by air from production in Belgium to a storage facility in Michigan so that the minute the U.S. government says it's okay for emergency use, those first shots will be ready to rush across this country. United Airlines is flying the vaccine on chartered cargo flights. I say that by January, we'll have 40 million doses to distribute across the country. In just a few weeks, some of this country's healthcare workers and other first responders could get the drug before anyone else. But there aren't enough doses for all of them. And tomorrow, a panel at the CDC in Atlanta will decide who gets immunized first. Today, drug maker Moderna added more welcome hope to the effort by formally asking U.S. authorities for emergency use authorization of their potential vaccine, which they say is at least 94 percent effective and 100 percent effective preventing severe disease. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration could give the green light for emergency use to Pfizer after December 10th and Moderna after a hearing on December 17th. We've been clear about the fact we're not going to cut corners and the, the, the authorization process, although expedited, has very similar criteria to what we would use for the regular approval of a vaccine. Right. Government officials believe most Americans should be able to get a vaccine by next June. 100% of Americans that want the vaccine will have had the vaccine by that point in time. FedEx and UPS delivery services tonight are getting a hold of the dry ice that they'll need to ship the vaccine. A company that makes special freezers for the drug can't make them fast enough. When you start to think about the logistics infrastructure to distribute 14 billion, the two dose uh, scenario, 14 billion vaccines globally, that in itself starts to add up. 14 billion, quite a number. Steve Osinsami joins us now from Atlanta. Steve, all eyes now on a key vaccine meeting happening in Atlanta tomorrow. That's right. There are health experts from across the country who will be meeting here at the CDC where they will actually take a vote 
on who should get this vaccine first. In particular, we're looking at possibly seniors and or healthcare professionals who deal with patients sick with COVID-19. They're also going to be discussing where the vaccine should be headed to first. For example, communities that are hardest hit. It's then up to the states to take those recommendations and turn them into practice, Lindsay. So, Steve, you talked about where the vaccines will go, but it's also important to know who gets to decide uh, who will get those vaccines. Right. One of the things that, that, that they're making clear is that these are recommendations and that it's up to the states to decide. But, you know, these questions are going to become more and more difficult uh, as there is much more of, of course, a demand for these vaccines because there's there's a limited supply. You know, the, the, the amount of vaccine that we are looking for in this country that we need to essentially immunize most Americans won't reach the point that we need until probably sometime next summer. Lindsay. Steve Osinsami, thanks so much. Hospitalizations, meanwhile, continue to surge to new record levels. And as we close out November, the U.S. has broken its own record 19 times just this month. Healthcare workers are feeling the strain as many state and local governments look to reimpose stricter measures to help ease the crush of patients. Our Matt Gutman has the latest. Tonight, the image of that doctor wrapped in PPE and cradling a COVID patient resonating nationwide. It was taken on Dr. Joseph Verone's 252nd consecutive day of duty. We're exhausted. We are tired. I have nurses that in the middle of the day start crying. And in the original epicenter of the pandemic in this country, New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo warning another pause could be on the way. We are now worried about overwhelming the hospital system. Every hospital has to identify retired nurses and doctors now. We're already experiencing staff shortages. More doctors, nurses, and patients spending Thanksgiving in crammed COVID wards than almost anyone thought possible. A new record set almost daily. Tonight, 93,000 Americans hospitalized with COVID. In Rhode Island, they're running out of room, opening two field hospitals this week. Hospitals are full, patients are scared. Staff is really tired. Here in California, with cases, hospitalizations, and deaths tripling this month, Los Angeles County ordering a stay-at-home order banning indoor and outdoor gatherings with anyone outside the household. New Jersey also tightening restrictions. Public health experts warning Thanksgiving holiday may only have made it worse. Over 1.1 million travelers screened at TSA Sunday, the busiest day for air travel since the pandemic started. Americans traveling against the advice of the CDC now told to assume they have the virus. But that increased demand for testing pushing the system to the limit. The line behind me here in Los Angeles is over two hours long, and the demand for testing here is putting a strain on capacity. Every single slot offered by the city of Los Angeles has been booked for the past 10 days. Up to half of all states now report a shortage of testing supplies. If we can't test people early, we can't identify them, we can't stop the spread. And the elderly remain the most vulnerable. Just two days before Thanksgiving, Leslie and Patricia McWaters of Michigan married for 47 years, dying from the virus within 60 seconds of each other. Their family writing in their obituary, they did almost everything together, so it should be no surprise that they went to be with the Lord together within the very same minute. Just a heartbreaking story there. Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt, are you hearing any concerns over whether this huge surge in demand for testing is causing any issues? Oh, it's causing massive issues. Um, we're hearing from labs that they are already backed up. Uh, manufacturers of the testing kits themselves are already warning testing sites that they are short of supplies. There is so much demand right now that it physically can't be manufactured quickly enough. And you would have thought, Lindsay, that by now everybody would have been beefing up capacity for this type of testing. I I'm not exactly sure what has been done. Uh, but what is clear is that we are facing something of a testing shortage and testing um, re agent shortage in the coming days and weeks as more and more Americans seek to get tested. And Matt, there in Los Angeles, how are residents reacting to the banning of gatherings of any kind, even outdoors? 
it's really rough, you know, and you live out here and think about it. It's not just bad that you ha can't gather with anyone outside your immediate household, even to go for a walk in the park, right? Or in the mountains, outside, outdoors. So it is drawing a pretty significant amount of anger among uh, some local folks. There have actually been protests outside the health officer's um, house here in Los Angeles demanding that you repeal this. I don't think it's going away with the numbers that we are seeing. Lindsay, there has been a tripling of COVID cases, hospitalizations, and deaths here in LA County and California in general, just in the month of November. Matt Gutman, thanks so much. Now to the president-elect's transition. Biden received the presidential daily briefing for the first time today. This came as he formally announced his economic team. As tonight, some Republicans are already saying one of his nominees does not stand a chance of being confirmed. Many of those same Republicans, including President Trump, have not yet even acknowledged Biden's victory, despite more states certifying their election results. Today, Arizona and Wisconsin certified for Biden. Our Mary Bruce reports in from Washington. After weeks of stonewalling by President Trump, President-elect Joe Biden today finally received his first presidential daily briefing of classified national security information. He also announced his economic team, trying to make good on his promise to diversify the White House, address income inequality, and deliver for working families. For Treasury Secretary, former Fed Chair Janet Yellen, who would be the first woman in the role, Cecilia Rouse, a Princeton economist, is now the first black nominee to head the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Another first, Neera Tandon. She could be the first woman of color to run the Office of Management and Budget. But Tandon, who leads a liberal think tank and has skewered Republicans on Twitter, is already facing pushback. I think in light of her combative and insulting comments about uh, many uh, members of, of the Senate, uh, mainly on our side of the aisle, that uh, it creates certainly a problematic path. But Democrats blasted Republicans for complaining about mean tweets after four years of Donald Trump. It will be very tough to take those crocodile tears seriously. Most Republican senators have not even publicly acknowledged that Biden won the election. But each day, more states are officially certifying his win. Today, Arizona. The votes have been tabulated. All 15 counties have certified their results. In Pennsylvania, a federal judge appointed by Trump himself dismissed the president's efforts to throw out votes, writing calling an election unfair does not make it so. Charges require specific allegations and then proof. We have neither here. In Wisconsin, Team Trump paid $3 million for a partial recount that actually uncovered 87 more votes for Biden. And in Georgia, the president is still railing against the Republican governor and secretary of state who certified Biden's win there. The governor's done nothing. He's done absolutely nothing. I'm ashamed that I endorsed him. Trump's false claims of fraud threatened to undermine Republican efforts to win Georgia's two special Senate elections on January 5th. RNC chair Ronna McDaniel asked by one Republican voter why they should even bother if the president says the system is rigged against them. How are we going to get money and work when it's already decided? It's not decided. This is the key. It's not decided. The RNC chair still not instilling confidence in our election system. Mary Bruce joins us now from Washington. Mary, that encounter, a uh, sign of the fine line that Republicans have to walk as they fight for control of the Senate, while many, including the president, are still pushing fraud claims that Georgia's Republican secretary of state repeatedly has debunked. Yeah, look, Republicans are really trying uh, to, to somehow navigate this incredible balancing act here because on the one hand, they are really eager to get Republicans out to the polls, to get them to vote in this special in these special elections, which of course will determine the balance of power here in Washington. But yet on the flip side, you have the president himself continuing to completely undermine our electoral system. You can understand why voters, especially Republican voters and Trump supporters in Georgia, may be a little confused. And Mary, the president-elect had an injury scare this weekend while playing with one of his dog's houses foot doing. Yeah, Joe Biden slipped and twisted an ankle while playing with one of his dogs over the holiday weekend. Doctors then discovering a small hairline fracture. Lindsay, he is now going to be in one of those medical walking boots for several weeks. Okay, hopefully he'll get it off in time for inauguration. Mary Bruce, thanks so much. Thank you.
Joining us now is ABC News contributor and former Trump Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert. Thanks so much for your time, Tom. We'll get to the transition in a moment, but let's get back to the pandemic first. Now, you initially expressed your concern back in February with us about how bad things could get. Nine months later, the pandemic appears to be worse than ever in many parts of the country. A pandemic record 1.2 million travelers passed through TSA checkpoints just yesterday. That was despite warnings by officials to stay at home. How concerned are you now about the surge that we may see in the next few weeks. Yeah, Lindsay, we're right back to where we started. The whole objective was to buy time until we got the pharmaceutical solution. And in that time to try to keep the amount of sickness below the healthcare system's capacity to handle it. And what we're seeing is that we have failed to do that in at least 30 different states. And of course, it looks like more. So the healthcare system breaks. And when that happens, you don't just have COVID patients being treated by ill-equipped uh, facilities and, and physicians, but you have others going untreated. And so we are at that line that we tried to flatten the curve beneath from the outset. And today the White House hosted an indoor holiday party. This is precisely the type of gathering that CDC officials are discouraging Americans from having this holiday season. In your view, does this type of party undermine messaging from public health officials to stay at home? Yeah, you know, it not only does, but think about this at a personal level, it really makes it harder for those of us trying to convince our family and our friends and our friends' families that these types of things, temptations to be sure, like going to holiday parties, Thanksgiving dinner just behind us and Christmas gatherings in front of us are really things to be reconsidered. This is the real problem with this virus. We're not, we're not trained as human beings to think of our friends and families as people that might be dangerous to us. So we have a hard time wrapping our mind around it. I'd prefer to see our public leaders making a different decision here and setting a better example. The inauguration just 51 days away. Until then, the Trump administration is in charge of pandemic response. While the administration has touted vaccine successes, do you think that enough is being done right now to prevent this pandemic from getting even worse before Biden takes over? No, not at the federal level at all. In fact, I think too many people around this president and perhaps even this president have subscribed to this great Barrington Declaration notion that we can simply keep the disease away from the vulnerable. Well, that's not working out very well for us. In fact, we're seeing in nursing home facilities and long-term care facilities all across the country that the amount of virus in a community makes that impossible. And so the idea of doing these things to allow half the country back to work and the other half to somehow magically stay away from the other uh, are really just not a plan at all. So there are appropriate steps being taken at state and local levels, but I don't see a uniform approach or a coordinated one supported by federal authorities yet at this late stage. And the president had said before the election that the military can help distribute the vaccine. In your mind, does the military have an important part to play in vaccine distribution? Well, the president's right on that. I think the military is an important part to play. I think they have a lot of uh, inherent skills and experience in logistics management of this scale. And remember, the military also partners with and works closely with private logistics support companies like FedEx and UPS and others. So uh, I think that they'll bring their expertise to bear here in a life-saving way. In this regard, the president on, on pharmaceuticals and on distribution of vaccines uh, really does uh, have a good plan. And, and Tom, you, of course, worked in the Trump administration and collaborated on the transition with Obama officials. What types of conversations and what kind of planning should be taking place right now with regard to COVID? You know, I did with the Obama team in both incoming and outgoing roles, right? I transitioned from Bush to Obama and then uh, back from Obama to Trump. And what I saw were two well-trained, well-organized, well-led transition efforts that recognized beyond just the candidate and the outgoing president, but all of their cabinet members and support, supporting staff need to be brought up to speed. And that's the hard part. So we see PDB briefings and intelligence briefings at a, at a very senior level. But really, for a president to govern, he has to have, uh, or eventually one day she, a whole, a whole set of 7,000 appointees ready to help pick up the responsibilities of running all the apparatus of government. And President-elect Biden received his first intelligence briefing today, 23 days after the election. Are there real national security concerns with this gap? And, and what must happen in the Biden transition as a whole to make up for all this lost time? You know, I don't want to overreact too much about this gap. We've seen this before, uh, but it's an important time. 
we've seen our enemies try to exploit this you know, kind of transition and operational responsibility before. And the exploitation doesn't just happen during this transition period uh, to the left, so to speak, of an inaugural day. It also it continues for the first months and even the first year of a new presidency. And so I think it's hard for me to say whether enough is being done. The incoming team is, is very experienced. They've all worked in these roles and departments and agencies in the past. But I would say that it's important to get moving because, as we all know, intelligence failures come right now and they turn around to bite us in the next six months or year. 9-11 and the 9-11 Commission really highlighted that. But in my experience, there are things that people need to see on a, on a daily basis that really never even make it to the president or president-elect. And the faster those people can be nominated and confirmed, the better. Tom Bosser, thanks as always for your insight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Tonight, the accusations of international espionage are growing louder from Iranian officials still seeking answers after its top nuclear mind was assassinated. The nation is now vowing revenge and accusing Israel of using electronic devices, specifically a remote control machine gun, to kill the scientist. Kira Phillips has the details. Tonight, new details surrounding the mysterious death of Iran's top nuclear scientist. <inaudible> Iranian officials blaming the attack on Israel, saying electronic devices used to allegedly assassinate Mohsen Fahrzadeh remotely. A drastic change from earlier reports that he was killed in a roadside ambush after a truck explosion. Israel has yet to comment on the attack. Now, FARS, the semi-official news agency close to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, claiming it was a remote-controlled machine gun that fired at Fahrzadeh as he exited his vehicle. ABC News has not confirmed these claims. Weekend protests in Iran calling for revenge, chants of death to America and Israel. And Iranian TV with a highly produced broadcast of the scientist's funeral, Iran's defense minister vowing to continue his work. Kira Phillips joins us now. And Kira, the Biden administration had hinted at a thawing of tensions between both nations and potentially taking a second crack at the Iran nuclear deal. But this has to complicate those efforts. Absolutely, it does, Lindsay. And when I talked to White House sources tonight, they're monitoring the fallout of this attack and they are very concerned about a new Biden administration revisiting uh, the negotiations into an Iran nuclear deal. Uh, President Trump has made it very clear he doesn't trust Iran, especially when it comes to nuclear weapons. So as far as what the Biden administration will do, we are yet to see. But I can tell you right now, if you monitor the protests that are happening in Iran, they are seeking revenge. Lindsay? Kira, thanks so much. The Navy is announcing they will scrap the warship USS Bonholm after a fire this summer. The 22-year-old ship was docked in a San Diego port on undergoing renovations when a fire erupted. It would have cost more than $2 billion to repair the amphibious assault boat. A new ship would cost $4 billion and take less time. Defense officials have opened an arson investigation into the incident. And when we come back, the missing boater found 86 miles from land clinging to his capsized boat. The surprise acknowledgement about those $1,200 stimulus checks and what we're learning about who reportedly got them but should not have. Up next, we paid so much attention to Black Friday, but now it's Cyber Monday. What deals should we be looking for in these final evening hours, or should we wait for even better bargains? Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace America. 
Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth weekend of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smarten up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news, straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Look at this. We are still in awe about how this Formula One race driver managed to survive the breakup of his car after a horrific crash. And look, he walks right out of the flames. The driver is still recovering in the hospital and is crediting a new device called the Halo with possibly saving his life. The system is put on top of the Formula race cars to protect drivers from flying debris. It is Cyber Monday, and early data is showing that today could be the biggest online shopping day in history, with sales up to 35% higher than they were last year. Here's ABC's Rebecca Jarvis with how to get the best deals of, that, of the season and what this could mean for retailers hit so hard by the pandemic. Tonight, with the pandemic keeping more holiday shoppers at home, Cyber Monday spending expected to smash records. Consumers could spend as much as $13 billion online today, a nearly 35% jump from last year. Shoppers snapping up everything from toys to electronics. These AirPods now $120. And with more students learning remotely and laptops in high demand, Best Buy launching deals on top computers like the HP Chromebook. We're seeing an increase in demand in a few particular categories, think home appliances, because more and more people are cooking at home. This KitchenAid mixer on sale for $189 at major retailers. And fitness trackers heavily discounted, Fitbit offering up to $50 off its watches. Right, people now have purchasing power right in their pockets. For more now, let's bring in Rebecca Jarvis with just a few hours left of Cyber Monday. What kind of deals can we expect after today and any tips on getting the best prices? So, Lindsay, you're going to see deals all throughout the holiday season. That is one thing that won't be any different this year. But an important thing to keep in mind is that with all of this online shopping taking place, most of the projections expect that there will be far more packages needing to be delivered by Christmas Day than there was actual capacity to get them there. So making sure that you purchase early is going to ensure that that gift can be under the Christmas tree. So that's an important key. But also, if you missed out today, don't worry, there will be more deals to come. And keeping in mind those brick and mortar stores, and, and what do these record online sales mean for, for many businesses, especially those who are that are hit hardest by the pandemic? Well, it's been a brutal holiday season in stores. If you think about the fact that on Black Friday, holiday in-store shopping plunged more than 52%, we're just not shopping like we used to. And 
while that's really convenient for many people and certainly the most health concerning way to go about shopping, it's a problem from retailers' perspective because the impulse purchases that people traditionally make when they go into a store to get that $50 TV, which is the doorbuster deal, they might end up buying the full price sweater. Well, now when people are fully shopping online, Lindsay, they don't go for the full price items. They look only for the sale and we've been conditioned to expect a sale without those impulse purchases. Retailers don't do as much business over the holidays as they've done traditionally. And it especially can become an issue if you think about retail workers, which are a big part of, of America right now. Those are workers who many of them lost their jobs earlier in the pandemic. Without that in-store shopping, it puts those jobs at risk. And it certainly means that the job function that people in retail will be serving in the future is more of a delivery service, shipping service, and logistics than being that face-to-face -face interaction that we're so accustomed to in stores, Lindsay. Always great to have your perspective. Rebecca Jarvis, thanks so much for coming on, my, ship, my friend. Still ahead here on Prime, the Grinch that may spoil your ability to go out and purchase some of these Cyber Monday deals. And we're not talking about COVID. Actress Laverne Cox speaks out after she claims that she and a friend were attacked. And good riddance to a punishing and historic hurricane season where we literally ran out of names. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day and perhaps the easiest choice of the day for the decision makers at Merriam-Webster Dictionary who just unveiled the word of the year, you guessed it, pandemic. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, nonstop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events events and moments all playing out right before your eyes see those flames behind me and go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only abc news gets watch abc news live right now and anytime streaming on roku hulu facebook and abcnews.com abc news live streaming everywhere right to you abc news live here on the ground and the Iraq. 18,000 tons. Matata. Ismail. Yes. David. David. Over ground zero from Hurricane Michael. You can see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you for Thank you. mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, Say there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. Wake me up. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. Welcome back, everybody. Today is officially the last day of the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. And like other 2020 calamities, we are not sorry to see it come to an end. Here's a look at this record-breaking storm season by the numbers. 30 named storms developed in the Atlantic Basin, the most in any year in recorded history. 13 of these storms became hurricanes, and six became major hurricanes with winds of 111 miles per hour or greater. That's twice the typical number. Louisiana was hit especially hard, where five 
five named storms made landfall a record for any American state. This season surpassed the previous record of 28 named storms in 2005, which included Hurricane Katrina. And for only the second time in history, we ran out of Roman alphabet names and had to use the Greek alphabet, starting, of course, with Alpha. The latest Hurricane Iota is the ninth Greek lettered storm. It unleashed 160 mile per hour winds over the Caribbean Sea before battering Nicaragua. And while the hurricane season is officially ending, more storms could still develop before the 2021 hurricane season officially begins on June 1st. Still lots to get to here on Prime. The Supreme Court hearing President Trump wants undocumented immigrants to be excluded to the maximum extent from the census in the future. If the justices agree, that could have major political impacts, we'll explain. The new series exploring black markets around the globe. And where is that monolith now? Apparently, it's missing again. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. Number one in politics and most watched on this historic election night versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news. Most trusted, most watched. ABC News is America's number one news. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. As coronavirus deaths increase in more than half the country, another company hopes to bring its vaccine to market. With a 94% efficacy rate, Moderna says it is filing for emergency use authorization with the FDA. The vaccine is expected to be highly effective at preventing symptomatic disease and very effective at preventing severe outcomes from the disease. It will be the second company to seek approval for a vaccine behind Pfizer. A record number of people were hospitalized over the weekend for COVID-19 in the U.S., over 93,000. Despite CDC warnings not to travel, the TSA screened more than 8 million people at U.S. airports over the Thanksgiving holiday, and health experts are worried. Two or three weeks down the line, we may see a surge upon a surge. In Indiana, hospitalizations there have never been higher. And it's not just about dying. There are countless more that will have lifelong disabilities from this. In New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo announced a new phase in the war against the virus. The main concern, hospital capacity. If we hit a real hospitalization crisis, 
uh, we could potentially do a New York pause. Remember those $1,200 stimulus checks back in March? The IRS confirmed some foreigners who don't even live in the U.S. also got them. One Swedish woman in Stockholm tells NPR she was one of those recipients. The IRS admits it mistakenly sent checks to those who received some federal benefits. The government says $34 million were sent overseas, but there's no idea how much was an error. And it could happen again as Congress works to pass another coronavirus relief bill. A boater from Florida has been found alive, clinging to the side of his ship one day after he was reported lost at sea. Crew members aboard a container ship yesterday spotted Stuart B. desperately hanging onto the side of his capside boat, 86 miles off the coast of Cape Canaveral. Rescue crews went in search of the 62-year-old man. Once he was reported missing Saturday morning, his condition has not been made public at this time. Laverne Cox, the actress and LGBTQ activist, claims she was the victim of a transphobic attack over the weekend. All of a sudden, the guy is attacking my friend, and I look back and I'm like, I was like, what is happening? The guy is like hitting my friend, and then my friend is like going towards him, and I'm like, holy And I pull out my phone, and I call 911 to, to dial 911, and all of a sudden it's over and the guy is, is gone. Cox speaking about the incident on Instagram, saying she and a friend were attacked while walking in a park in Los Angeles. This happened on Saturday, she says. Cox says a man first verbally assaulted them and then physically assaulted her friend while ordering them to get out of the park. The man got away, and Cox and her friend were not physically hurt. Lighting up the charts like dynamite and breaking boundaries. Korean boy band BTS topping the Billboard Hot 100 with their new song, Life Goes On. The number one sung predominantly in Korean, a first for the Hot 100. The last time a number one song was sung mostly in a language other than English was with Despacito. Despacito. Life Goes On is the group's third number one on the chart, an honor shared by Ariana Grande for 2020. For President Trump and his family, this year's White House Christmas will be their last. A series of indoor holiday parties will begin tonight that seem to defy the advice of their own public health experts. Karen Travers has more. America the Beautiful, that's the theme of this year's White House Christmas decorations. First responders and frontline workers are honored in the Red Room. The library is dedicated to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women earning the right to vote. The East Room celebrates American innovation in air, road, and space travel. First Lady Melania Trump was absent from the unveiling of the decorations today. Back in October, the First Lady was heard in an audio recording obtained by CNN using expletive lace language to complain to her then good friend Stephanie Winston Walkoff about decorating the White House for Christmas. They say I'm, I'm complicit. I'm the same like him. I support him. I don't no. say enough. I don't do enough. No. It's, where, it's, where I am, I put the, I'm working like a I know. Christmas stuff that, you know, who gives a about Christmas stuff and decoration, but I need to do it, right? Yeah, but Correct. 100%. You have and no then, choice. The news of that recording broke just hours before President Trump revealed he and the First Lady tested positive for COVID-19. Mrs. Trump later said that the recordings were released out of context by someone who wrote a book to try and distort her character. Our thanks to Karen. And attorneys for President Trump appeared before the U.S. Supreme Court today not to challenge the 2020 election results, but to challenge the 2020 census. The president wants to exclude millions of undocumented immigrants from a key count before he leaves office. It's never been done before, and if he succeeds, it could have a sweeping impact on our politics and the allocation of federal funds for more than a decade. Our Devin Dwyer covers the Supreme Court and followed today's oral arguments. He joins us now. Devin, remind us about this case. And what's at stake here? Yeah, the census, Lindsay, is about so much more than just counting how many people live in the United States. It's used to determine how many votes each state gets in Congress, how many tax dollars each state gets for things like education and health care. The Constitution says that's supposed to be based on how many people, whole people, are in each state. The president, however, wants to subtract undocumented immigrants from the count. As you said, that's never been done before. Three lower courts have struck that down, uh, and now the justices have to consider whether or not that can happen. 
happen here. So much on the line for states like California, Florida, New York, with big immigrant populations. They could lose seats in Congress and billions of taxpayer dollars as well. And, and were there any clues today about how the new conservative majority, including three Trump appointees, might rule? Yeah, you know, the court was so skeptical, including at least two of the president's appointees of the president's plan. In fact, I was struck by Justice Amy Coney Barrett, the newest member of the court. She said uh, that the history and text of the Constitution do not appear on President Trump's side in this. Take a listen to what she had to say. A lot of the historical evidence and the longstanding practice really cuts against your position. And, you know, there's evidence that in the founding era, an inhabitant was a dweller who lives or resides in a place. There's nothing usual or settled about your residence if your presence is violating federal law and the sovereign hasn't agreed to let you stay. But if, if an undocumented uh, person has been in the country for, say, 20 years, you know, even if illegally, as you say, why would some person not have a, such a person not have a settled residence here? So a lot of skepticism of the president's plan to exclude all undocumented immigrants, Lindsay, but they did seem to keep the door open to perhaps a more tailored approach. Maybe the president could exclude some subset. Uh, if he revised his plan, opponents of all of this said they would bring this back in court if that happens. But for now, it's a race against the clock, both for the court to decide this and President Trump. They're under a deadline by law to deliver that critical census count to Congress in just days uh, before before the inauguration in January, Lindsay. So a lot at stake in this critical case. Very unusual for this to be decided in such a quick, compressed manner. Right, all taking place at the 11th hour. Okay, Devin Dwyer, our thanks to you. Thanks, Lindsay. If you are in the market for some of the hottest video game consoles of the holiday season, they are almost completely sold out. But you might be surprised what's to blame, and it's not the pandemic. Becky Worley has more. They're the most sought after gifts this holiday season. Sony's PS5 and Microsoft's Xbox Series X video game consoles. Nearly impossible to get, seemingly sold out everywhere. It's literally really, really hard to get right now. Like, you cannot get your hands on it. Like, if you try it online, good luck. Black Friday shoppers camping out for days, but some stores only getting in a few at a time, if any. We've been trying to get the PlayStation 5 for a very, very long time. At this GameStop in Dublin, California, Morgan Swanger got the last Xbox. He's hoping to resell the $500 system online for at least $850. I'm just planning on selling it, making like quick $300. And he's not the only one looking to flip them. Experts say online shoppers barely had a chance this year because of bots. Software programs that can check inventory and complete a purchase infinitely faster than any human could. Wiping the inventory clean just milliseconds after items are posted. Resellers listing the $500 consoles for up to four times the price. There are bots that are specifically designed to break through all of the other thousands of people who are trying to get onto that website at that exact moment, and they are able to place a bunch of orders simultaneously for a bunch of different consoles. This kind of bot isn't illegal, but they do break many retailers' rules. It feels like somebody is cheating in a system that has been set up that's supposed to be flat for everyone, and it's up to retailers to try to police that as much as possible to limit supply per customer uh, as best they can. Our thanks to Becky for that. In National Geographic's upcoming series, Trafficked, Peabody award-winning journalist Mariana Von Zeller takes a deep dive into black markets around the world, giving the audience an interesting glimpse into the lives of those making the deals. Take a look. So what do you do, Victor? Well, you know what I do, I'm in the game. You call it scam, we call it the money game. How long have you been in the money game for? More than 12 years. We just left high school. We didn't have no jobs at the time, and we were getting in so much trouble, so we decided to want to try or something new. Do you remember the first time you did it? Oh, sure. On the phones, I met a guy, I think his name was Mike. First time he sent me like uh, $500. I couldn't believe it. First day of my life in this game, the amount of money I see. Mariana, thanks so much for joining us. So in that clip, Victor, a self-described mid-level boss from Montego Bay, he told you that he was fairly young when he got into trafficking, and he goes on to further explain that he considers what he's doing to be reparations. In fact, at one point, he admits that he almost robbed your crew. Are all these traffickers motivated by tough-like circumstances, or, or would you say that there's more to it? 
I'd say that the vast majority are, you know, it's, it's about where they're born and the circumstances around where they're born and, and, and live and the families that they're born into, you know, every, everyone from sort of cocaine traffickers or, or even pimps and scammers, like you saw in that clip in Jamaica. Uh, it's a lot more about, again, the circumstances that surround them than it is anything else. And, and you do a really good job of concealing these traffickers identities, but with the illegal nature of the underground world, how difficult is it for you to gain their trust? and how do you get their trust? It's not easy. I'd say it's definitely the most challenging part of my job. It's getting their trust and getting access into these worlds. You know, there's months, sometimes even years that goes into sort of building trust, getting sources, finding people willing to talk to us. You know, it's knocking on doors, making calls, sitting down with people for hours on end, getting no after no after no until somebody agrees to do it. And I think part of it is, yes, building that trust. You know, there's always a lot of fear that we're not who we say we are, that we're law enforcement instead of uh, journalists, for example. So there's a lot of sort of sitting down with them. And uh, usually there's drinks involved, what I call the, the, <laughs> the underground first uh, dates, uh, where they invite us over and they sort of want to learn more about me. And and after that, yeah, it's either a yes or a no. It's, it's definitely not easy, but it's all about building trust. And, and this isn't your first time covering the underworld. You also reported on a drug war in Mexico, as well as the tunnels that are used to traffic goods in and around Gaza. But uh, this time around, the size of your crew is definitely a lot bigger. Were you worried that this could be a hindrance of the rawness of the story? I was, you know, I'm used to traveling with two, three people max. Usually we're, we're a team of two going around the world and gaining access into these worlds. I've been doing this for over 15 years, gaining access into these worlds. But National Geographic being National Geographic and, you know, having this incredible look to it and really sort of putting a premium on their on their on how beautiful everything looks on the channel. They put, put this challenge to me. Okay, we want to do it. We want the show, but we'd love to sort of make it look uh, even, you know, make it look sort of uh, like a Hollywood movie. And and it does. You know, that's one feedback that we get all the time is how incredible the, the series looks. And, and I, yeah, I was concerned. And now I'm traveling with a group of seven, eight people and with, I don't know, like 20 cases of gear around. And I definitely thought that was going to make it difficult, more difficult to gain access into these worlds but so far it really hasn't at the end of the day it's really establishing first of all a one-on-one -on -one connection between me and the people in these worlds um and then uh, through that there's sort of uh, uh, a trust that happens around the crew but sometimes there's also situations in which not the whole crew is not allowed so it's just me and one other person or two other people that also happens and, and i'm curious how you handle that i mean while you're following these traffickers all around the globe you're put into a lot of anxiety inducing situations i'd imagine when you have the larger group um the, the nerves wouldn't be as bad but when it just becomes you and one other person how do you handle that uh, well, it's it's experience. It's it's being you know having done this so many times, and uh, it's uh, being calm, never panicking, always being calm, almost always always having a plan in place. There's always a plan in place, and there's a lot of security procedures that people don't see, but they are there. And and then it's uh, enacting on that plan, you know. Uh, of course, when you hit the ground on these stories, as you all know, as a journalist yourself, is you know, nothing is as what you thought it was going to be. You, know, you have a preconceived idea of what the story is going to be about, and then you hit the ground, and actually nothing is what you expected it to be. But those are ultimately the most interesting stories to tell. Um, so yeah, it's remaining, it's keeping calm and focusing on the task at hand and showing the people that you're with that you trust them, that you know full well that your security sort of is in their hands and you trust them. And by trusting them and being clear about the fact that you're there just to listen to them and try to understand their world, that, uh, that they will then trust you as well and be more willing to sort of open up and, and, and treat you well and ultimately not rob my crew and myself like uh, Victor in Jamaica said he was going to do until he met us. And this series, of course, highlights traffickers and all their duplicities. On one hand, they're criminals, but on the other, they're still very human with normal needs and fears. As you uncovered their layers uh, of stories, do you find yourself able to connect with them in any way? And what would you hope that the viewers will take away? 
Absolutely, that is exactly it. It's the word connect is key here. Uh, you know, it, it was my main goal for this series was not only to get access to these wonder worlds, but more importantly for me was for people to be able to connect with these traffickers. You know, uh, the more I learn about them, the more I spend time with them, the more I realize that there's actually a lot more that connects us than what differentiates us. Of course, there's a lot of fat people out there. I'm not, uh, that's definitely, that's the case. But one thing that you find when you start working and, and, and talking to these people and listening to their stories is that, you know, they are mothers, they're fathers, they have goals and aspirations and dreams and very much like our own. And, and it's actually hard not to sort of empathize. Um, you know, I always come from a place of empathy instead of judgment. And I always try to connect. And for me, key as well is for other people to connect to, to, to these people. To, to all the viewers to connect to these people. Mariana, thank you so much for your time. Trafficked premieres on Nat Geo Wednesday night at 9, 8 central. And when we come back, why everyone needs a friend like the one this turkey has. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. Number one in politics and most watched on this historic election night versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show and number one in streaming news. Most trusted, most watched. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime, Nightline. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's most watched program across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch ABC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. And now to the plot twist. Remember this, that 10 to 12 foot monolith found in the desert? Some wondered if it was art. Others said that it could be a warning from aliens. One thing not in dispute tonight, it is now missing. Federal officials in Utah are blaming an unknown party for taking it after it was discovered earlier this month. Officials never disclosed its location, but that didn't stop the curious among us from making the trek before it vanished. Many of us had turkey on the menu over the holiday weekend, but for the Neff family in Center County, Pennsylvania, the turkey became more family than feast this year. The young turkey made fast friends with the youngest member of the family. Our Will Gans has the story, which starts with a rather blunt admission from mom. So the plan was, is we were going to hatch them, raise them, and then they were going to be dinner. But no foul play for Via the turkey this Thanksgiving. It was nighttime, and we heard a crack, and it was Via's egg. Macy Neff knew from the moment Via was born back in March, they'd be best friends. I mean, best friends. It just started out with instant 
snuggles on the couch when she was very tiny. And then, I don't know, their little relationship, they just bonded. What exactly does a six-year-old girl do with an eight-month-old turkey? I like to gobble with her sometimes. As one does. I do like, go, 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 go. Macy and Via stuffing as much quality time into each day as they can. Whenever they lay on the couch together and watch TV, wasn't very normal. <laughs> but TV time is tame compared to playing Barbies with Via. She doesn't know where to get all of the toys, so you, you, you gotta like throw them at her and she'll get used to it. Um, and you also gotta give her some dolls because she loves dolls. Teaching Macy some important life lessons. She has learned responsibility. Um, she's learned kindness respect of animals. For my daughter, something really great came out of that pandemic and she built this awesome relationship with her pet. Better than a presidential part in that turkey has a friend for life. Our thanks to Will for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Now, this wasn't the best way to start the work week. This bicyclist knocked down by big and clearly dangerous waves on a Chicago bike path. Local meteorologists had warned about the potential danger of the waves, but that did not stop this I guess we'll call him brave person. Fortunately, he was okay, albeit cold and soaked. No word if he made it to work on time or if at all. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us and good night.